We're going to wait one more minute and then we'll get started. Welcome. Welcome. Hopefully some more people will be joining us and we will be taping this so it can be shared with others in the future. I'm Pastor Heidi Newmark and I am very excited to be here uh, this, well for some of us it's afternoon and for here in New York it's the evening with Pastor Nelson Rebel, who is a pastor in Lodi, California. Um, he's somebody I have long admired and uh, he has a lot of experiences and perspectives that uh, really need to be heard and shared more widely. So I'm thrilled that he's um, been able to join us this evening. I wanted, uh, we're calling these evenings Living Sanctuary um, because uh, my recent book is Sanctuary Being Christian in the Wake of Trump. And I wanted to use the that celebration of having the book come out to lift up uh, other voices uh, that um, speak to a lot of the themes and carry them out in their own places and in their own ways. So welcome to everybody and thank you, um, Pastor Rebel, for being here with us. Um, so I'd like to invite you to tell us how you ended up in Lodi, California, and then a little bit about your congregation and your work in the community as part of your pastoral work. Thank you, Pastor Heidi, for this invitation and uh, always been a great admirer of your faith and your, your love for, for the church and your love for, for the people of God. Uh, so I, I am from Puerto Rico. I was born and raised in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, my Upbringing was in the Iglesia Luterana Sion in the town of Bayamon, which is part of the metropolitan area. When I was uh, about in my mid twenties, I went to the seminary in Philadelphia, the, at the time Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Uh, I studied engineering. I worked for Motorola. There was a huge Motorola facility in Puerto Rico. I worked there for a few years as a uh, out pr process manufacturing engineer. Then I always had the call for ministry, so I went to uh, to Philadelphia, got my NDIF, and started my STM. I got assigned to a church when I finished, assigned a church in Puerto Rico, was there for a few years, went back to Philadelphia, then uh, got assigned to a church in southern New Jersey, about uh, 20 minutes from Philly, and I spent there, it was an, an uh, Anglo Church, uh, English speaking congregation, wonderful people. We were able to work with, uh, it, it was a, the town of Turnersville, New Jersey, it was not a very uh, diverse town, about 90% Caucasian, but our congregation was about 30% diverse. So e even though the town was not, the church was diverse, um, became more diverse with the ministry we did. So I spent there about 13 years from 2005 all the way through 2018. And my last service was on the Ash Wednesday of in February 17th of 2018. Then I started uh, my journey over to California. And I started here in Lodi, California, which is Northern California, north of Stockton, about 40 miles south of uh, Sacramento. So it's what it, the, the region called the Central Valley, which is basically mm -hmm basically the bread basket for the United States, about 90% of the produce comes from this region. A lot of, you know, not just wines, the grapes, tomatoes, uh, onions, garlic, almonds, all kinds of uh, produce, but also um, we're about an hour and a half from the high tech region in the, in the Bay Area. So it's a very, it's a, African Americans uh, call it Calabama. It's somewhat conservative. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Alabama. <laughs> Calabama, yeah, Calabama, or if you go further south to Fresno, the, they call it Mississippi Fresno, because wow. of the history of, yeah, <laughs> the history of racism, which we have seen and experienced, and uh, I know we're going to talk about that, but uh, going back to your question, make it uh, 
uh, more direct. Um, so my congregation, I was called as the associate pastor at St. Paul Lutheran Church. My colleague and friend, the Reverend uh, Mark Price, who is a senior pastor at that church, saw the change of the demographics of this little town of 67,000 people of Lodi, and saw that uh, it was 40%, that two thirds of the student population of the Lodi Unified School District was two thirds people of color, students of color. So they went through a long process of discerning of calling a Spanish speaking pastor to reach out to the community. So that's how I ended up you know, being uh, drafted from the East Coast over to the West Coast to work with uh, a growing number of uh, migrants, mostly from the region of Michoacán, Mexico. Uh, but there's also from Honduras, uh, there's some uh, from uh, different parts of Central America, but mostly Guatemala, Salvador, but mostly from Michoacán. Mm -hmm. And regions of Oaxaca, there's some from Guerrero, but the, the big bulk of uh, people um, come from Michoacán. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're, you're very active as a pastor among your congregation, but you don't stay within that little community. You're very active in the larger uh, region, uh, both Lodi and the regional community. And uh, and you've been active in special ways w since we've had um, this pandemic. And maybe you could tell a little bit about the work that you've been doing. Thank you. No, thank you, Pastor Heidi. Uh, so when I got here about, again, two years and nine months ago, to be quite exact, um, I met a pastor called Pastor Curtis Lamont Smith, who is an African-American pastor, a colleague, friend of mine. Um, that uh, I met, and I call him now my friend, my, my sibling in Christ, because of the work we have done together for the last two and a half years since I met him. Uh, he's the executive, not the executive director, the, the director for uh, Faith in the Valley, which is ascribed, it's like a subsidiary of Pico, Pico, uh, Pico California. And um, for people that don't know, um, tell them what Pico is. Yeah, PICO is a people improving communities through organizing. It's a uh, one of one of the largest, if not the largest, community uh, faith-based community organizing organizations here in the U.S. And they have a, a big, huge presence here in California. Some of you might have heard of Pastor Ben McBride, who is the, one of the executive directors for PICO California, and. Uh, so it's a huge organization, it's faith-based, and they're trying to advocate, they, they advocate for uh, immigration, uh, migrant rights, for uh, anti-racism, uh, for, you know, poverty, um, you know, um, for the poor communities, for marginalized communities, LGBTQI plus uh, rights, and all the marginalized groups in, uh, in, in the nation. So they're very active in that sense. So I was able to, he asked me, uh, when the about so Pastor Curtis asked me about I would say April May could you help us uh, if we were to give you some money could you help us reach out to the migrant population that's when it's, uh, you know the in March mid March is when the pandemics hit art and many of them lost hours or diminished they had diminished work. And we were starting a month into it. We started many of the communities uh, of many migrant communities started to feel the pinch of not having income. And most of them rent their homes. Just to give you an idea here in San Joaquin County where I live, there's about 22,000 families that are, as we speak, uh, they could be potentially evicted. And there's about 750,000 people in the San Joaquin County area. So assume four people, and again, this is a very uh, low number, we're assuming four people times 22,000, we're talking about more than, uh, you know, more than 100,000 people being evicted, uh, you know, given the, the current uh, economic uh, situation created by the pandemic. So there was, money was raised by, in, by Faith in the Valley. And so far they have uh, trusted us with about $835,000. Uh, 
almost a million. We're still waiting, maybe hopefully some extra money, not as big, but maybe as a bit more. Um, and we have been able to help so far about from, from every, there's about nine counties that conform the, um, the Central Valley from Kern County on top of, uh, you know, right, right on top of uh, LA County, all the way here to right below Sacramento. Sacramento County, uh, I, I didn't have jurisdiction there, but every county below Sacramento and above Kern County that is part of the Central Valley, we helped about 770 families total. And each family got from 500 to $1,500. Hmm. And the, the impact of that, uh, it, it's been profound because a lot of the people, I was able to reach out to other community organizers, friends of mine that knew people, let's say in Kern County, in Fresno, in Modesto, Stanislaus, uh, even uh, other Lutheran clergy in Fresno and uh, in Livingston, which is basically, uh, I believe is uh, Stanislaus. Um, and we were able to, to create like, a, you might say a network. And there were like 50 families from Fresno that two Lutheran churches, two new missions, uh, Latinx missions in, in the Fresno region were able to help with the money that they received from us. So they were able to improve and expand their ministry thanks to this connection with Faith in the Valley and again, connected to Pico. And they have been able to funnel that money through our parish, it, we the other half of the money went to the Roman Catholic Diocese of Fresno. So in many ways, we were administering as a parish what the Roman Catholic Parish, uh, I'm sorry, what the Roman Catholic Diocese of Fresno was administering. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So the only difference was that we did it in a very personal touch. They gave us some money for administra administrative uh, expenses. So I hired little staff. And we were, what we were able to do was to do it personally, to try to get, go to where the people were, hand out the check, you know, have the pastor dressed up with the biggest cross I could find, give them a blessing, give them some hope, give them encouragement, because this is a hard, this has been hard on the migrant community. And yeah. some other groups have been like, you know, sending, uh, they have taken a less personal approach so we knew that we needed to do something more personal because the community needed hope. So I think that's what in many ways made us uh, attractive to uh, Faith in the Valley and Pico to keep funding us. Initially, they only gave me 35,000. That was the initial amount of money they gave me. Then when they saw the way we did it, they gave me 300,000. And then they loved the fact that the staff, it's not, it was not just me, let me just clarify that. Bianca Duenas, Marcy Diaz, Carlos Gabriel, um, Bertha, um, and, um, and Jessica Evans, they all helped. And we were able to create a very personal, you know, experience in the sense of every most, I would say 90% of those families uh, received the check personally by me or a member of, the, of this group. And that was a, a big difference. They needed to see, and, and also, also the churches in Fresno and Livingston, that their pastors, the two churches in Fresno, the one in, in, in Livingston, the, the, the Lutheran pastors were able to hand out those checks and have conversations with those families that were suffering. So in that sense, the church was connected, the parish, our congregation was connected to a larger organization and we were able to create a partnership that's still very strong today. So I would imagine that your um, your con so your congregation has a, a Spanish speaking part and an English speaking part. Correct. I, I would imagine that everybody was in support of this. Would that be? Um, but I also know you're very active in anti racism work. Yeah. And how has how has the congregation felt about that? I think it's challenging. Uh, this town is where I'm, where I'm located. Uh, some people have reacted negatively to my, to what I said before. And, you know, many of you took it kind of like jokingly, but it's how we people of color feel about this region, like Calabama or Lodi reminds me of, and I said it, I said it uh, many times, uh, Lodi reminds me of Alabama prior to the civil rights. 
extreme segregation, lack of representation of people of color at every level of government, including police, city council, and, and the school district. So in that sense, it's the same uh, Pastor Curtis, who's African-American, like I mentioned, the director for Faith in the Valley, he was telling me, and we, when we were in our conversation with the chief of police that we, we meet every month, uh, we created, Pastor Curtis, myself, and other groups, of, a, a group of uh, members of the community that were, we, we kind of like planned the first uh, Black Lives Matter uh, marches and vigils here in town we gravitated towards each other and we created a new organization called A New Lodi. And out of that group, we have started to create connections um, supported of, by Pico, Faith in the Valley, Gamaliel, all the different churches. Uh, the Episcopal Church has a, one of its uh, deacons is a member of, of A New Lodi. I am the, the, the chairperson. Uh, <coughs> we have different uh, members of the community represented LGBTQI, African-American, um, and also a, a biracial couple from, from that conformed the, the board of a new Lodi. <clears throat> and what we have been able to do is meet with the chief of police and create uh, kind of the expectations that we have and, and the dialogue that we need in order to create more um, trust between the community, the underrepresented community, the marginalized community and the police. And that's something they, need, they needed to understand. It, it, it doesn't matter whether it has happened here or not. Uh, you know, some something similar to what happened to George Floyd in their minds. That's so, something that we heard constantly. It was the fact that the people did not feel comfortable talking with the police because of some of the history of racial profile uh, uh, that many people, you know, again, less than 2% of the population is African-American. I have not met an African-American that lived in Lodi that has not had an experience of racial profile, of racial profiling here mm -hmm. in the city. And that's saying a lot, right? And the same thing with many of our, the Latinx members of, of the church that come from Stockton, which is about 10 minutes away from where we are. They all have experienced that same racial profiling. So, what Pastor Curtis told me, which is a, it was an eye opener about the work that we're doing is that in one of our conversations with the chief of police, who's a wonderful man, I think he, he, his heart is in the right place. Uh, like any uh, person is still, you know, we all need growth and to keep walking the walk. But I think his heart is in the right place is that he, he mentioned, Pastor Curtis, that we are similar, Lodi, to Ferguson. Because of what happened on September 6th, when in one of the marches, we had Proud Boys and militia and ex-cops surround a group of some of the marches that we were supporting. Because I asked them to stop in the corner of the church as they were marching for me to give them a blessing. And I was personally harassed. <laughs> for doing that, even question my affiliation, my faith, my love of God, my love of the people and other things and other names that were thrown out, not just at me, but the, the people who, who continue to march and uh, they were subjected to um, racial slurs that were horrible. And I, I don't, obviously we're not gonna even say a word here, but the point I'm trying to make with this is that we forced the city because of what happened. We made a campaign as a new Lodi. We amplified the voices of the people of color and we, in a way, asked the city, but we demanded the city to apologize. And they did. And I think it's the first time in the history of Lodi uh, that they have done that. When Three, four years ago, when they had to go to voting district to be more representative, to give a chance to people of color to maybe be in city council, they reluctantly went through this to district uh, voting because the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund told them, if you don't go to district voting, we're going to sue you. And they did, but reluctantly. And some of the members of that council, you know, four years ago are still in power. Thankfully, we elected two new, uh, two people of color were elected to the city council, there's five districts. So two out of the, well, now two new members of the city council are Pakistani uh, of, of, 
Pakistani origin. So well, that's a, a, a wonderful, uh, you know, my, might say a, a step forward in the right yeah, that's a wonder, huge step forward. So we're going to switch themes a, a little bit, although maybe it's not. Um, it's really not that much of a change. But I wanted to talk with you about La Virgen de Guadalupe, oh, sure. because I know that both both of our congregations in different parts of the country mm -hmm. uh, enjoy that tradition and um, and that celebration. And so as I kind of um, intro to that, I'm going to read a really short section from my book. Um, it's in the Advent season because the celebration is always on uh, December 12th. Mm -hmm. uh, the chapter is called La Morenita, which is a term of endearment um, for Mary, um, uh, kind of the, the dear brown one. Mm -hmm. um, even though in most of our Lutheran churches, if Mary appears in a stained glass window, she, um, she's quite white actually, but la morenita. Um, so I'm just gonna read a really short section from that. It, this, what I'm reading comes after describing, uh, describing the play that tells her story um, that the children are doing in worship. After everyone took their bows, we sang La Guadalupana, my favorite Guadalupe song led by an enthusiastic group of young students of mariachi music. Together we sang the refrain, Sierran Mexicana, Sierran Mexicana, Sierran Mexicana, su porte su faz, meaning that the appearance of Mary was Mexican. She bears the color of indigenous Mexican people and is often affectionately called La Morenita, the dark one. Mm. The children were passing on the torch of their treasured cultural heritage and history but this story belongs to all of us because it is also deeply biblical and surprisingly Lutheran. Mm -hmm. Most of Luther's critique of Mary and piety stemmed from his belief that the church of his day had taken Mary away from the people and held her captive in a prison of gold, distant and unreachable. Luther notes, quote, among the drowned trotted people, she was one of the lowliest, not made of high station in the capital city but a daughter of a plain man in a small village. Likewise, the vision of the Guadalupe is a vision of correction and reform for the church, reorienting the church to the margins. Mm -hmm. She appears not as the white-skinned virgin brought from Spain, but with the hair and features of an indigenous woman. She speaks the indigenous language, Nahuatl. It reminds me of Luther's insistence that the church should speak the language of the masses, not Latin, known only by an elite minority. Mm -hmm. Not only did the Virgin of Guadalupe speak to Juan Diego in his native tongue, she gave him a powerful message to take to the bishop. The untutored peasant layman received a word to evangelize the church, like the shepherds of the Christmas story, whom the angels entrusted with the message of Jesus's birth. Who would have thought, wrote Luther, the men whose job was tending unreasonable unreasoning animals would be so praised that not a pope or bishop is worthy to hand them a cup of water. La Morenita's message rings true down through the generations to our own in a church that systemically privileges the white middle class. Women of color leaders in the Lutheran church persistently encounter the disregard experienced by the four congresswomen Trump accused of being very racist and not very smart. There are many from the margins, like Juan Diego, laying their talents and energies on the line to bring a word of change to the church and to Washington. Too often, they face the same disdain that greeted Juan Diego. So I, that's a, a short a short section. But I don't know if you have heard this, um, Pastor Rebel. Um, I've heard many people say that La Virgen de Guadalupe, that's a Roman Catholic celebration. Um, and it's for Mexicans. You are a Puerto Rican and um, Lutheran, not Roman Catholic. So uh, how did you come to this tradition? And uh, what does it mean for you? And what does it mean for your people and yeah. your church? Well, let me just tell you a story. Uh, when I did back uh, last year, 
in October, we celebrated with a, a, a Roman Catholic clergy of mine, a friend of mine, the 20th anniversary of the joint declaration between the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans. He was telling uh, me about this uh, conversation he had with the bishop about, well, he, the bishop uh, from, his, from the diocese, from the Stockton diocese, told him, you know, that Lutheran pastor, he, you know, some of our people are going to that celebration. A lot of them went, you know, about 200 people came to our celebration the first time we did it. And he told him, he said, he said to me, Pastor Nelson, I told the bishop, the Virgin of Guadalupe belongs to everyone. So this is a Roman Catholic priest, a friend of mine, mm -hmm. who told, like Juan Diego, told the bishop, and he's from Michoacan too, he <laughs> told the bishop the truth. Like the Virgin Guadalupe, the Virgin Mary belongs to all of us in the sense, like Luther said. Luther said in his comments about the Magnificat that Mary, in many ways, is kind of like our spiritual mother. He's the first Christian, the first mm -hmm. one to receive the message, to, in many ways, literally uh, bear a Christopher, a Christophero, right? Uh, mm -hmm. She bears Christ. And isn't that our calling? Isn't that what faith, a faith active in love means? So, so I just want to mark the conversation first in that statement from my, and I'm going to say his name. He's a good friend of mine, Father Misael Avila from St. Francis of Rome Church in, I uh, 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 forgot the name of the town right now. It's, uh, anyway, it'll come back to me. <laughs> It's about an hour south of me where he's at, he's at um, uh, Riverbank, Riverbank here in, in California. Um, and uh, when for the people, the first time we celebrated the, was in 2018, December 12, 2018. And the joy, I never forget this uh, Karina who came to me and said, uh, Father Nelson, uh, can I come dressed up with my with my purepecha attire? I said, of course. So she came with her very traditional, lovely dress, and she brought the flowers. It was such a, a beautiful moment to see people like they were asking me permission. And I realized, no, this is basically what I said to them was, no, no, this is your celebration. You tell me how to do it. And you yeah. do it. I, all, all, I'm go, I'm, all I'm here for is to pro open the keys to the church and go, you know, go and do what you need to do and decorate. So we had our monte or a mountain of Tepeyac, the little um, hill where the Virgin Guadalupe, according to the tradition, uh, appeared to Juan Diego. We had uh, a mother, I'm sorry, a daughter and father, Temo and Angela. They reenacted the story. And they're from, uh, 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 they're from Mexico, migrants, work on the fields. And, and that joy that, uh, I mean, it's just, if I go, I start mentioning names. Christina, who decorated uh, the, uh, the altar, they put lights, uh, it, was, it was beautiful. The only thing I did really, literally, it was open the doors to the church. That's all I did. And the celebration, the mariachis, we hired a group of mariachis. Uh, we had, uh, again, 200 people. And we only started the ministry in March. And already by December, we had this wonderful community coming in, feeling welcome, willing to share who they were with us. For me, that that's just a gift to us. Their yeah. devotion, their dedication, their... Uh, they see in Mary, the way I understand it is that what I see trying to uh, articulate a theology out of this, if you will, is that Mary, or the Virgin of Guadalupe, represents that visit of God and that siding with God with the poor. That's really what it means uh, for, for, for people who mostly the most devout followers of the Virgin of Guadalupe are the indigenous people in Mexico. So my question is, and when people go to the question where, whether this event happened or not, mm -hmm. I always say, are we going to tell Juan Diego that he's a liar? 
I'll leave it at that. Whatever God did there or didn't do, it doesn't matter. The faith of the people tells us that God sides with the poor and that Juan Diego's witness against an intolerant uh, hierarchy. Isn't that the same thing Luther did, you know, in 1517 and Juan Diego did in 1531? So they're separated by 14 years. So I think in many ways, Juan Diego, it also has a spirit of reform instilling mm -hmm. him by the this vision he had of the Virgin Mary. And there's a transformation in the piety of Mexico, which is a, de a devout, devout uh, community and, and country. So is there something wrong with that? I'm trying to, I'm being, you know, it's a rhetorical question. Of course not. Of course not. Um, what, what are you going to do this year? Diff the, uh, 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 because well, of I'm going to open the doors of the church. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, in this case, we're trying to do, trying to keep everything socially distant. We're doing all our services outside because of the weather. We were able to do it here in California. Mm -hmm. um, although here in Lodi, it gets a little cold at night. We're, it, this uh, day, so December 12th falls on a Saturday. So we may do it a little early, like four o'clock, five o'clock. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're going to do it on the parking lot. And we're going to do the, we're going to have, uh, we already have a mariachi uh, sign up. We have, uh, we're not going to have food this time, but we're going to have a big, wonderful celebration with a service, a worship service. And the lessons are the lessons from the Magnificat. And in many ways, it's just, again, an announcement at Advent. So that's why I love that about your book that you put it in Advent where, it, where it's supposed to be, an announcement. And this announcement of, the celebration of the Virgin Guadalupe reminds us that a new reform is coming in the voice of an indigenous man, Juan Diego, in the voice of a peasant young woman from Palestine, and in the voice of a peasant young baby, newborn baby from Palestine as well. It's so, so it's such a gift. It's such a gift to yeah. the church. Well, um, there's so much we can talk about, but we did we said we would take a few questions. So um, I guess we could do that now. Alyssa, are there any questions? Alyssa, questions? Yep, let me read the one question we have here. What did these people who celebrated La Verden de Guadalupe with you find at the Lutheran church that they did not find at the Roman Catholic church? That's a powerful, a powerful question and this is a, this is a conversation that I have had with uh, my my colleague uh, Misael. Um, part of it was the fact that the church here in Lodi is not as welcoming as it could be, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, because of the Lodi native uh, attitude toward Mexican migrants and a little disdain for some of the traditions that come from Mexico, including the celebration of the use of mariachis during mass and the, the dresses. Uh, and that has been an issue. Other churches are more, you know, more welcoming. Roman Catholic churches do a wonderful job, you know, but there are some that there are racial issues going on. And I think Lodi is one example of that. And I would say in our case, which is um, different, slightly um there there are you there are Rome, wonderful um roman catholic celebrations uh but it's easier to get lost in them that because because in fact i mean it, it's a it's a good thing they're so much bigger but for for people who are um it, it's it's easier to get lost in that and people who come from smaller um villages who remember or where their family were very involved in doing the decorations, mm -hmm. in doing the drama. Um, there's less opportunity when it's when there's just so when it's just so big. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, um, well, like Nelson, like I I didn't know how to, I, I just said, well, you have this celebration, you'll have to lead it because. Mm -hmm. And also more uh, most um, some of our long-term leaders in the church who were Latinx were Puerto Rican. 
-hmm. Well, they didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So it provided um, a real leadership opportunity um, mm -hmm. for, for the, in, in, in this case, it was Mexican immigrants mm -hmm. also. And so they could organize the whole thing. They mm -hmm. could decorate, they could plan the food, they could cook the food and, and um, they were very excited about sharing it mm -hmm. with others. And in okay. fact, after a number of years, wanted to, it to be bilingual. Mm -hmm. uh, but but they, they could just have that hands-on leadership experience um, partly because it was smaller. So that, that mm -hmm. was another thing that, and then they felt they were doing something to honor Mary rather than just coming in while other people had, you know, I mean, they were still, obviously, if you go to the big mass and with a thousand people, you're, you're praying and you're singing and you're joining in, but, but there's people that prefer the more hands-on opportunity. Yeah, and I, I would just say, Pastor uh, Heidi, that's exactly the same thing here. Uh, and and I, I did mention the racial component because that's some of the characteristics of, of this town. Mm -hmm. It has sadly many uh, have gravitated to our Catholic churches in Galt, which is north of us, or south in Stockton. And, and there's a group that has gravitated to our church, but it has been the racial component. And like you said, most of them come from small villages. And they like that uh, intimacy of the celebration being part, like you mentioned. So thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? There is a comment, if you guys want to comment on this. The comment reads, on December 12th, 2006, ICE conducted a massive raid at the Swift meat packing plants in, the, in and around Logan, Utah. Many of us believe the raid was intentional, as if to show that the empire holds the power. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to talk more about empire and the way in which it impacts your communities. Well, it kind of reminds me of um, Nazis um, uh, doing atro atrocities on y picking Yom Kippur to mm -hmm. to do that, picking a day of of deep um, religious meaning to do something. Yeah, you know, and, and here in the region, they have attacked the the few places where the Latinx community and the migrant community in general feels safe, like sanctuary cities. Um, so yeah, the meatpacking places of, uh, where they work. Um, yeah, we have, we have seen that, um, in, in this region, meatpacking, uh, industry, the fruit, fruit packing industry, uh, being targeted as, as they come out of work and, you know, lining up to, to arrest them and deport and, and deport most of them. And sometimes the kids not knowing what's going to happen with their their parents um it, it's, it's it's very sad it's just completely sad i see one other question um pastor nelson could you speak a little about the relationship between the english speaking and spanish speaking communities at saint paul's sure thank you monica um i i think the relationship is one of mutuality in the sense that it was the resources and the, the established congregation, the English speaking congregation that opened the doors to the, uh, to this ministry, to this possibility. Uh, at the same time, I think that like everything, you know, there's edges that we need to work around and uh, there's potential for improving those, uh, those relationships and, and that collaboration. Uh, but overall, I think it has been a, a great, um, a great opportunity for for both but many um let me put it this way many members of the caucasian uh, uh community within saint paul have come and told me literally that since the spanish ministry began new life has come into the church in many different aspects not just in terms of the the food and the music and uh, the joy of seeing new people that they didn't know before that because of class and the segregation that exists in the town were, they were never ever gonna be able to, to see face to face or have, a, or have an interaction, but also the engagement of the ministry. And you mentioned that in one of your questions, Pastor Heidi, in terms of the uh, 
when you invite a group of people into your community, migrants, the BIPOC community, black indigenous people of color, when, when you, you invite people who have been the LGBTQI plus community, when you invite them into your church, hopefully they come because they feel welcome and supported and, 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 and embraced. But you're not just inviting them physically, you're also addressing, engaging, and taking on the issues, the struggles, the hopes, the, 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 the dreams, the challenges that they have. And I think that's the most difficult part for many of our churches to deal with. And the challenge for, uh, and I'll be very blunt about it, for many of our uh, Caucasian congregations that come in, uh, that, that come in into this type of arrangement is that second dimension. It's not so much the people, but once the people come in, is actually the, uh, the issues they bring in terms of, let's say, immigration rights, migrant rights, LGBTQI plus rights, you know, anti-racism work. That, for me, in my experience, is what has been more challenging. Yes, for, it's easier to say we welcome everyone, um, but as long as we do things- You don't want your right. issues. <laughs> yeah, we don't want your issues. <laughs> Keep them out, out the door. And it's kind of like saying, you know, I, I don't see color. Yeah. The same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for the question. Uh, I think we we're about, we need to wrap up unless does anyone have one last question? Well, I would, I would say, I said at the beginning, um, this is taped. Um, it, Alyssa, is it, going to be it on our YouTube? It will be, yes. It will be up at our Trinity Lutheran Church of Manhattan YouTube. So if you'd like to share it um, at some point, it's there. Um, mil gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Nelson Rebel, uh, for sharing your, um, your witness and your passion and your love uh, with us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Pastor Heidi. And thank you for the book. And I'll just plug it for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have it. I bought it. And I invite everybody to read it. I was actually telling my spouse to do it too. And it's inspiring because it gives, it, it gave me hope knowing that, like I told you before we started the, um, uh, this transmission, that sometimes we just need that little bit of light from someone else to ignite even more light coming out of us. So thank you for your light. Well, thank you. Thank you for your light. And thanks to everybody who joined us tonight.